let us use our imaginations tonight. Let's think of ourselves in Jerusalem. Let's climb the stairs to a furnished upper room there. Uh, night is falling, but there's a full moon in the sky, perhaps the color of blood. And as we enter the room, the upper room, we see the oil lamps and the play of light and shade on the ceiling and the walls. There's a table with cups and dishes, herbs, bread, wine, there's good smells, fine scents. There are couches to recline on. And there we see Jesus and his disciples. Night is falling and there's a sense of trouble. He's talking of betrayal. He's saying goodbye. He talks of going somewhere, going away, going to his father. He talks about his hour having come. What does he mean? The disciples must have asked themselves, what is he talking about? Has it to do with what he said before about falling into the hands of men and dreadful things happening to him? Yet he talks about glory too and scripture being fulfilled. And the hearts of the disciples are at the same time burning and bewildered. Here's this man, this irresistible man for whom they've left so much, their jobs, their security, on whom they've staked their whole lives. Surely he can't be going, he can't be leaving, he can't be about to die. And he, well, he eats and drinks with them, he talks, he takes bread and wine, says mysterious words, and gives them to them. He then gets up from table, puts on a towel, and starts washing their feet. One of them, after a whispered conversation, gets up and leaves the room. And Jesus talks and talks. He has always astonished them. But tonight, he's more himself than they've ever known him. He seems to grow and grow in their eyes. He has a new stature. He, we might imagine this, he kind of fills the room. He is present everywhere, like an all-pervading twilight hour, says a poet. Something that has been growing in him, maturing in him, in his solitude and prayer, is now coming out, coming to birth. It's the eve of his passion and the hour of his deepest doing, and the room seems to expand with him. Perhaps the disciples sense that they're not alone. They're not the only ones there. This is the blood of the covenant which will be poured out for you and for many, he says. Perhaps they sense that these mysterious many are there with them. I am not praying only for them, he says, but for all those who through their word will believe in me. Perhaps they sense these believers to come, all the disciples of all the generations still to come, and us too, us, are present at the table with them. And so this room, this upper room, this night has become all-embracing, universal, cosmic. Everything is there. We are there. And the evangelist John uses just two words, two verbs, to explain this uncanny width or spaciousness. Jesus knew, he says, and Jesus loved. He knew and he loved. 
He knew his hour was come. He knew he was the son of the father who had come from the father and was going to him, making the true Passover. He knew and he loved. And he loved to the end, says John. And it's this knowledge and love of the Son of God that embrace and enfold us tonight. This is the space we are in. This is the upper room we're in. He knew, he saw the disciples of all time. He saw, he sees each one of us. He saw our inability to measure up to him, to reach his stature. Stature. He saw us, he sees us, limits and all, wounds and all. He sees our sadness and brittleness. He sees our perplexity, our false enthusiasms, our Peter-like bravado. He knew it. He, know, he knew, he knows us through and through, and he loved to the end. He knew and he loved. And so, on the night he was betrayed, he, let's say, surpassed himself. He devised the Eucharist. He took some bread, thanked God for it, broke it, and gave it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this as a memorial of me and the same later with the cup. A uh, holy woman, Chiara Lubick, said, O oh God, you could not have invented anything better. For the last three years, Jesus had taught, told stories, told parables. He had healed. He had cast out demons. He'd gathered disciples. He'd, he'd elicited their faith founded his church, he'd chosen Peter and the Twelve, he had cleansed, purified, pr and prepared them. But instituting the Eucharist, he did more. It all goes to a new dimension. He went further, he crowned everything he had done, he went to the end. In the incarnation, when he took flesh in Mary's womb, he had already married, let's say, humanity, but now he consummates the marriage. He showed he wasn't going to leave his wife, his bride, the church, us, childless and alone. So he put his life inside her and made her fruitful. He showed a capacity for intimacy that no one had ever expected. He gave the gift of a silent, living presence, his flesh for the life of the world in sacramental form as bread and wine. He gave the memorial of his death, his sacrifice, and of his resurrection so that this wouldn't be lost in the past, wouldn't slip further and further away as the centuries roll by but we'd be very close to us, on our lips and in our hearts, in our ears and eyes, and would follow us through the years. He would be present on our altars and in our tabernacles, but so as to be present in us. He knew and he loved. He knew the need and he loved to the end. He loved to the cross, that means in the first place, to the gift, the sacrifice of himself. But he knows, as well as knew, it isn't all in the past. He loves as well as loved. He loved crucified. He loves us risen. And in his crucified and risen Eucharistic body, he extends that love to the very end. Think of it, to the end of our every emotion and secret thought, even to the tips of our fingers and toes, capacity for intimacy. His body 
in our bodies, his blood in our blood, his soul in our soul, his divinity in our humanity. He loves from our first communion to our last. He loves to the end of our life, for better or worse, in riches and poverty, in sickness or health, and beyond. He loves his disciples to the end of time, through all the church's ups and downs, trials and tribulations. He's there. The Mass is there. The words are there. His body and blood are there. And so the walls of his knowing and loving are always around us. Even if I'm in a situation where I can't receive Holy Communion, this knowledge and this love aren't close to me. The Holy Spirit is secretly at work, growing my hunger, let's say, making me back into an upper room as I respond. And when the hour comes, I will be able to say my Amen again. There it is. This is the gift we commemorate tonight, the gift of the Eucharist. It is incomparable. There's nothing like it in the universe, in the world. It is unique. If you took it away from the world, uh, the world would, I think, cease to be, really, or become completely unbearable. And so, how can we not wash each other's feet? If he, our Lord and Master, has come so close, how can we not wash each other's feet? What space can there be in us for pride? There can't be any, surely, if we've been loved like this. If he has cleansed us with water and word in the sacrament of baptism, if he washes our feet in the sacrament of penance, if he gives himself to us so completely as in the Eucharist, if his knowing and his loving so embrace us, no, there's no space left for our pride. All we can do is wash each other's feet, forgive each other, accompany each other, go together to Jerusalem.